feel like I've always wanted to be a mum. Like I always knew that that was something that I wanted to do. And for whatever reason, I just always felt like something was wrong. There was no rhyme or reason for feeling that way. Um, but I just always had this like niggling thought in the back of my head. And maybe it was because I felt like this is the one thing in the world that I want to become that I want to have children and maybe it was just more of like a worst fear scenario but for some reason I always had a feeling that like something wasn't right um my husband and I met um we got married and a year after getting married we decided to start trying for a baby um so that was the summer of 20. 13 and I think initially I was probably really naive just to think that it was gonna happen really easily um and you know a month turned into two turned into six turned into a year and before we knew it I was kind of thinking right I just feel like something definitely isn't okay and I think now to be on the other side of it I know that you know trying for a baby if you conceive within a, a month it's like a miracle you know it takes a lot of people six months to a year even when there are no issues um but I was just really worried so I remember going to the doctors and just having like an initial conversation um and they said well we'll do some preliminary preliminary tests there's no reason to think that there is anything wrong but you know let's just start doing some investigation work so with a man there's only really one test that can be done as far as i know um so that came back pretty quickly we knew that everything with ashley was absolutely great um they did some initial blood work with me and again there was no alarm bells and we were just kind of left to go about our business and you know there's nothing wrong i'm sure it will happen don't worry about it um and I can't remember the exact timelines if I'm honest because it all just seems like such a long time ago now um but I know we carried on trying nothing happened and I remember going back to the doctors um and then I got referred to the hospital to have a desk uh, to have a test where they essentially put dye in you um and take an x-ray and it's to see if there are any blockages um and that all came back fine so again it was very much like right well that's ruled out any problems there so you know just just carry on as you are um, and more time went by and we were then diagnosed with unexplained infertility um, which I kind of feel is just a bit of a, a label I don't think that people really that it really is unexplained i think there kind of is a reason for everything um and then our options were to do ivf um there wasn't anything else that we could try different people do different things like different drugs sometimes ivf is like the last resort but for us because there wasn't anything wrong i was having regular periods this that and the other it was kind of like well that's that's the only avenue to go down um so we did our first round of ivf in 2016 i think it was um and it didn't work um i definitely hadn't prepared myself for the fact that it wouldn't work i think by this point you know three four years later i think i had had the assumption that ivf was kind of like the winning lottery ticket um and that of course it was going to work because we're doing ivf and ivf gives everybody a baby and um i kind of felt like well, it's our turn now like there's no reason why it wasn't going to work and we got our results just before Christmas and I remember being on Pinterest looking at like cute ways to reveal to people that I was pregnant on Christmas day because I was honestly like that convinced that it was going to work um and then we got the news that it didn't which was completely devastating um mainly for the fact that I just hadn't prepared myself mentally for that at all um and then we kind of prepared you at all for that I mean they had I think I was just very hopeful uh, you know they went through the statistics with us that you know I can't remember officially what it is but you know the statistics of it working is very low with IVF especially on your first round um I know a lot of places use your first round of IVF as more of like a fact-finding expedition I remember our doctors referring to it as 
so that they could know how my body reacted to the drugs and what tweaks they could make for next time. I think I was just very, very hopeful. You know, I'm a very glass half full kind of person. Um, very expensive experiment that the doctors are trying as well. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we were very fortunate that our first round of IVF was on was with the NHS. Um, for some couples, it isn't. Maybe they decide to have children later in life. But we were fortunate enough that the first round was with the NHS. Um, but either way, yeah, um, didn't prepare myself. And then in the end, we had to do another round of IVF. And it was only when we went to a different clinic and saw a different doctor um, that did a different test um, that we found out that actually it wasn't unexplained infertility at all. Um, I actually had a low AMH level um, and I had really, really poor... Uh, the, the quality of my eggs was really, really poor. I think they said something like my eggs were like that of a 50 year old. Um, so that was a big blow because obviously from 2013, we'd been told you're both fine. Everything's fine. We don't know why it's not happening. There's, there's no, there's no reason for it. You know, even through our first round of IVF, it was, yep, it's just unexplained. It just happens to some people. Um, and it was only until we went to do, like I said, our second round, saw a different doctor who was then like, hang on a minute, <laughs> this is not unexplained at all. Like your, yeah, your, your eggs are not great. Um, How do you feel when you heard that? Because that probably felt like you had almost wasted time as well. Yeah. I mean, it felt like we had wasted time and I think not the... Ashley and I, my husband, assigned blame to each other throughout the process at all. I think up until that point, it just felt like, well, it's not my fault and it's not your fault. Like, it's just one of those things. And getting that news, all of a sudden, it was very much, well, I'm the issue. And although we never looked at it that way, that's how I felt. It, I then went through these feelings of, if you were with somebody else, you know, um, yeah, that's really I feel bad. I feel I feel bad for you because you know you're lumbered with me. You know I I'm the issue, and I went through a a real stage of really loathing my body a little bit. I felt really angry at my body um, mm -hmm. that it wasn't doing the one thing that I felt like it was supposed to do. And I felt yeah, I felt I remember just I remember blogging about it because I used to blog a lot then about the process, and I do. I just remember feeling so angry. Um, but equally, um, my husband was very positive throughout the whole journey, as it were. And, um, he kind of looked at it as a positive in the sense of, well, now we know, now we know what the issue is. Um, and it was because we'd found out this information that our second round of IVF was different. Um, we did something called ICSI the second time round. So that's when they take one good egg and they take one sperm and they inject it so there was no with the first round my eggs kept getting shattered so they were never fertilizing because they were so weak and they were such bad quality whereas now they'd found out this information they were able to tailor make the second round um which was a much more successful round which obviously resulted in me getting pregnant and having emily so the flip side was you know that saying knowledge is power and it definitely was and it, it made everything so much different from that point on but it was yeah really frustrating to have gone through such a long period of time thinking everything was fine and then yeah it was just kind of like one blood test that wasn't taken and then as soon as this other doctor said well let's just run these bloods that it came back that yeah it was a completely different scenario to what we'd been thinking for so long yeah, that's so tough. And I'm so glad it all worked out for you now, but I bet it's been such a long journey and it's really taken its toll. Did you have any psychological support for you and your husband? Yeah. When you, when yeah. I mean, we were kind of, I felt like Ashley and I were a real team throughout that process. I think um, it's very hard for people to understand unless you're going through it or have been through it. Um, we've obviously both got like a great family and we've got great friends, but nobody could really relate to what we were going through. And it felt like we were just this little team trying to, you know, get to the, get to the other side as it were. Um, I felt like it 
brought us a lot closer actually um, throughout that time. And I actually started my social media off the back of what we were going through just because I couldn't find anybody in real life that was going through what I was going through. Um, so it was really nice to find people and connect with them and talk about IVF and, and all the rest of it and be able to say the things that you probably wouldn't say to your friends, you know, mm. um, when maybe I felt upset that someone had fallen pregnant or whatever. Um, you could go and talk to somebody that would completely get it, you know, and then at least feeling like you'd had like a load taken off your shoulders. And, you know, some of the friends that I have met through social media, you know, we met when we were both going through fertility struggles and now we have children and we meet up and, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So I think that was a, for me, a huge, a huge um, thing that really helped to get me through it. Um, and Ash, he's just kind of like a, a typical man. Do you know what I mean? Like he, he's not a feelings guy. As long as I was all right, he was all right to a degree. Um, I think he definitely carried a massive weight around with him, which I hadn't quite realized, but it was like the relief on his face when he held Emily for the first time. Like I'll never forget it. Like I think at that moment I realized just how much he had been worrying and how much he had been internalizing, I guess. And then as soon as she was here, it was like, I, it was almost like I could see a weight, like leave him. Um, so yeah. And I guess you, he was probably worrying a lot about you as well, because he was worrying about how you were dealing with it. So perhaps didn't want to take it on himself. Um, and show that he has issues happen to everyone so do you have any tips for a partner or men going through it as well oh gosh um I think my only frustration with Ash through it actually was that he was really positive which is which is unlike him he was really positive and I think some days I just needed to feel however it was that I felt mm. and I think sometimes his way of, of getting me through it was no come on it's going to be fine like don't be negative don't wallow in it let's you know let's keep on pushing through and I think my advice would just be to allow your partner sometimes a minute to feel however it is that they need to feel you know I don't think it would have been great or it is great to wallowing things and let those feelings take over for days on end but I think sometimes Ash just needed to allow me to have the evening to her you know have a cry eat a chocolate bar mope about a bit and then kind of like the next day be that cheerleader um, I think sometimes that's where we would clash a little bit so I think that would probably be my advice from my experience is just yeah be positive pull your other half through um and keep them in a good headspace but equally it Not is okay <laughs> just to yeah just to like feel how you need to feel and get it all out and then keep it moving I think that would probably be, be my advice yeah for sure that's great advice and obviously everyone's on different paths a lot of people may not even want to have children and then with the added pressure of not being able to have children when you do want to have kids how did you navigate family and friends always asking about your path and how and when you were going to have a child um I think we were really lucky in the sense of our family have always been I, I never really remember getting questions from family about when are we going to have a grandchild you know when are you going to have a baby? I think for me, it was more work colleagues. Um, Ashley and I met quite young. Um, we got, I think we got married when I was like 21, was I? Something like that. Um, so I think sometimes the natural progression with people is, you know, you meet somebody, it's when you're going to move in. You move in, it's when you're going to get engaged. You get engaged, it's when you're going to get married. And then it was kind of felt like as soon as we got married, it was come on Caroline you're next or you're not getting any younger or just those comments and it was definitely more in the work environment um I used to work for a really large company it felt like there was always somebody pregnant there um so I think people were just 
kind of always expecting it to be me next and because there was always people that were pregnant it was just like a natural conversation like oh Caroline like you know I can't believe such and such beat you to it like it must be you next um and all of it was said with love like none of it was ever malicious and I knew that but I think for me for a long time I didn't share what we were going through because it's obviously a really sensitive subject um I didn't want people knowing but it got to a point where it was like again I hate to be all cliche but it was kind of like the truth will set you free and I remember somebody saying to me about a guy called Ian and he was like oh you know I see such and such as pregnant like you're not getting any younger like surely it must be you next you'd be a great mum and I just remember thinking like oh I don't want to swear but I just remember thinking like ah I just said to him, do you know what, Ian, I'm actually really struggling. I've been trying to have a baby for the past three years. We've done a round of IVF and it's failed. And yeah, I'd love to have kids, but it's just not happening. And I remember him looking like so sad that he'd obviously upset me. But then I remember him turning around saying, do you know what, I've been there. Um, me and my wife struggled to have children. We got told that we would never have children um and we now have two boys and one's just off to university and by me being honest it opened up that conversation with him and I was like wow I wonder how many more people even that work for this company that have struggled or are going through the same thing to me and it was almost like as soon as I was just honest about it a people stopped asking to be honest but b it just opened up different conversations of different people um when I did the IVF at work it turned out that my boss at the time had done IVF three times, which then resulted in her having her daughter. So by me being honest with her, I was able to get an incredible amount of support. You know, she completely got what I was going through. And I think I really hit the jackpot, you know, with going through IVF and having a boss that had been there because you do need a lot of support. You do need a lot of time off work. Um, but again, it was only by me confiding in her that she then came back and said, oh, well, in order for me to have Lily, we did three rounds of IVF and have they checked this and has this happened? So yeah, I think it's, it's hard to be honest with something so personal, but just in my experience, the second that I was honest about it was when things definitely turned around. People stopped asking the questions, but also I found out that there were a lot more people that I was in constant, you know, I was in close contact with that had actually been in the same boat. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, while you're going through it, it may feel like there's absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. But what would you like to tell your former self now, when you were going through this, now knowing that I've known? Oh. I mean, it's hard because it doesn't work for everybody. Do you know what I mean? There will be some people out there who will do multiple rounds of IVF and they will reach a point where they decide not to do it anymore and they don't go on to have children. It doesn't happen for everybody. So I guess with me knowing that it has happened, I think I would have just told myself, relax, enjoy life, make plans, live in the moment, book the holiday that you want to and stop putting everything off and putting your life on hold just in case. I think that's what I tell myself if I knew that a hundred percent I'd have a child at the end of it. Um, but that's just not always the case, but I definitely feel that irrespective of the outcome, we had put our life on hold for a while. And again, it was only when we decided to, I think it's like 2016, we went to New York and we said, right, this is going to be our year. Like, it's not that we're not going to try for a baby and we'll do the IVF again at some point this year. But for now, we just need to kind of get back to ourselves a little bit. And it was that year that we traveled more and we went out more than we had in a long time um, and really focused on ourselves. And I don't think that that was a byproduct of the second round of IVF working, but I do feel that I was a lot happier, we were a lot happier, um, that we definitely started living a lot more. So I would just say, you don't know how long the process is gonna take and you don't know what the outcome's gonna be. So, you know, if you wanna go on the holiday, go on the holiday. If you wanna buy the car or go out for drinks with your friends, like whatever it might be, don't not do it because you just don't know how long you're gonna be riding this you know IVF infertility roller coaster for and if it's a long time you'll only look back and wish that you'd not sacrifice so much I guess 
Mm. And you don't want to look back with resentment as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now that you have got your, what's the most unexpected thing about motherhood for people who maybe are about to become new mums um, or who need a little bit of extra advice? Um, I think for me, the one thing that nobody told me about or prepared me for was the the weight of motherhood the mum guilt I think you see like quotes and memes and people talking about it all the time like mum guilt but I never really realized it was a thing I think for me when I was pregnant you know everyone just talks about the sleepless nights and how your life's going to change I think sometimes people I think there's probably two things I think sometimes people can be really negative and make motherhood and parenthood you know sound to be this this negative thing and I I think a lot of people go on about you know you're never going to sleep again and you know oh you won't be going to the cinema with your husband anytime soon and for me motherhood's been the most joyous thing of my life um I've enjoyed every moment of it um but yeah I think the other thing that people didn't prepare me for was yeah just the weight of it like I feel like I always have a hundred tabs open in my brain there's always something that you're worrying about you know you worry when their baby's about, are they sleeping okay? And, you know, you're constantly running, like checking that their chest is moving when they're newborns and are they getting enough milk and are they growing and are they developing? And then it's, you know, oh, they can sit up now and oh, they can crawl and oh, they can walk. And you think, oh, right, okay, they're walking now. Like we've achieved all these milestones, but then, you know, you start worrying about their speech and about their diet and Emily will only eat pizza and you know it's just constant there's always something to worry about there's always something to be working on I guess you know like right we now we need to toilet like potty train and now we need to get rid of the bedtime bottle and just it was just that like I don't want it to sound negative but I just think it's no one prepared me for how full my brain would feel all the time and the worry you know just the constant are they okay are they happy are they content are they learning enough like yeah they're getting their vitamins I mean that's my experience anyway like maybe I'm a bit of a overbearing mum I don't know but I just feel like I'm always worrying about her best interests and I just think that's something that yeah I wasn't prepared for or the guilt of have we played enough today but you know I need to empty the dishwasher and do the washing and we need to go and do a food shop but this isn't the best most stimulating thing for you to do but the things need to be done and I think for me it's just it's just that and that's why nursery is such a great thing because I feel like the tabs in my head are slowly starting to close because I know I can get so much done while she's at nursery and then when we're together a lot of that like mum guilt of oh you just sat by yourself playing and I should be playing with you but instead I'm getting another load of washing out the machine like I'm able to get a lot of those things done when she's not with me so when we're together I'm not so much in that position where it's like in a minute in a minute mummy will come in a minute I can just kind of be like yeah okay let's play like let's just do whatever but yeah I think I think for me it was just definitely I had I just had no idea of how yeah just you know you're, you're sat there in bed and they're asleep and you're googling things for them when you finally get a minute to yourself I think for me it was just yeah it was just just that just the mum guilt and the, the fullness of my brain at all times <laughs> yeah they're definitely important conversations that need to be had fertility and actually when you do have your child yeah yeah for sure I think you know I feel like I'm really lucky that I don't feel like I've lost myself in in ways I feel like I've really found myself in motherhood but you know I know friends that have had postnatal depression or friends that have really struggled with what their life is now they've gone from having very like cosmopolitan lifestyles and you know it's kind of like not that anymore and that's been an adjustment but again I just think they're all things that people don't talk about because you don't want to seem like you don't love being a mum or you know people don't want to seem or admit that they're struggling um I think they are all conversations that need to be had you know as regularly as possible because the chances are that when you are honest you find that a lot of people are going through the same thing and that's why although I probably don't talk about the infertility side of things as much because obviously Emily's you know three and a half now like 
when we were going through that, it was such a long time ago, but I'm always open to the conversation, always, because you, you, you have to be. If you can help one person, then that's a job done, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I think there's probably a lot of people that will be listening to this that are perhaps going through it right now or have just started their journey or at the end of the journey. And this will be such useful advice and mainly just to not feel like you're alone because it is such yeah. a but sadly it just isn't spoken about enough. And on another note, you've just done our virgin cleanse, haven't you? How did um, yes. you find that and especially coping with motherhood and the exhaustion that comes with that and so many different tasks that you've got to do? Did you cope okay with the cleanse? How did you get on? I loved it. I absolutely, I genuinely loved it. So my neighbor is very into fitness. She works out all the time and she is a customer of yours. And it was her that told me about you guys. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like maybe, maybe I'll give it a go. I feel like September has kind of been like my, my month to do things and achieve and try new things. And she was telling me that for her, the benefit was it, she felt like it was a really big reset. And once she'd done the cleanse, she then made much better choices when it came to eating. So I have like a mega sweet tooth. Um, and I think one of the huge benefits for me has been that since, because the cleanse, it's not easy. Like, I'm not going to say like, oh, it's the easiest thing I've ever done. Like everybody do it. It was, it was a challenge, but because I did it and completed it, I've now not wanted to put those things back into my body so for example since doing the cleanse I haven't had you know I used to be a big diet coke drinker I haven't had any diet coke I haven't had any caffeine since doing it I've definitely had like the odd sweet thing but I mean I think I was probably having I'd be if I was honest like a chocolate bar a day I would say you know like when you pop to the shops of M and like I'd grab something whatever um I haven't gone back to my old ways. I think the nice thing about the cleanse is like, I didn't have to worry about preparing any meals for myself. It was just, you know, done. Um, and it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be at all, actually. And I felt like, I know for some people it's like, oh, you just did a juice cleanse. But for me, I really felt like a big sense of achievement afterwards. Like I've never had so much fruit and veg in my system for, for such a long time. Um, I actually felt really energized actually which I think might be the misconception with people they might think oh gosh like you're not eating food like you must be really tired and it is just three days out of your life like it's it's three days like that's it and for me doing it and getting through it the the benefits since then have been have, have, have you know completely outweighed the actual like task of of you know of doing the cleanse in the first place so yeah I yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd recommend it yeah. to anybody that's what a lot of customers say it's not the cleanse itself that's always the most beneficial thing although that has so many benefits but also actually it really is just pressing that reset on your body and yeah. going forward you just want to continue to nourish yourself and actually put the best possible things into your body instead of those little tips and tricks that we've probably all um come up with since lockdown as well yeah yeah and I know a couple of people like had messaged me on social media saying like oh but did you lose weight and I, I said to someone I feel like if you're doing this because you want to lose weight it's not for you yes I did lose weight I think if you're just gonna like have juices for three days of course you're going to but for me it was never about weight loss it was about the health benefits and it was about yeah the reset it's it's definitely made me now make, like I said, much, much better choices since doing it. It's not something that I would say to people like, oh, just do for a quick fix. Like, of course, it's, you know, great before a wedding or this, that and the other. But I think if you really want to make a lifestyle choice and make much better eating choices, then it's a great thing to do. Because like I said, I just haven't, whenever I go to have something, I just think, well, what was the, what was the point in those three days? Like I had such bad headaches because obviously I have way too much caffeine. And so since then, you know, I've bought decaf coffee, given my diet Cokes away to my neighbor, <laughs> like, you know, cause I don't want to, I don't want to have that temptation. I don't want to put it all back, back in again, because there's no need for it. So yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'll be a, a customer always now. I really, really enjoyed it. No, oh, that's great to hear. And just to finish off, what would you 
tell someone who is perhaps maybe feeling really quite down about the whole infertility journey and thinking about giving up? Gosh, um, it's really hard because I'd want to say just keep going, but the reality is it doesn't ha like I said, it, it doesn't happen for everybody. Um, I just think my advice would be to know your limits and to know when enough is enough. Um, and I think if you're getting to that point where you feel like giving up, then maybe don't give up, just take a break. Just, I think the thing with infertility is it's so, it's so consuming or for me, it was, it, it consumed everything, you know, it was every party I went to, I was, you know, like, oh, I don't want to drink just in case, or I didn't want to drink because I didn't want to end up like being emotional and being the girl that's crying at the party because all of a sudden everything like bubbles up and just like spills out of you. Um, I think there's, I don't think we ever would have given up equally though. I think we always would have kept persevering and kept trying, but you know, I know people that have done or know of people that have done nine rounds of IVF and still haven't got there. So I think you have to know your point, but I just think my advice would be if you are having those feelings, maybe don't give up, just take a break, go and live a little, try for it, try to be in a space where it's not so consuming. I think that's really easy to say. Like I've been there. I know when people have said to me like, oh, just try not to think about it. All you do is think about it. Like, you know, you really do. But I just think for me, when we, when our first round failed and I was just beyond heartbroken, like I said before, we decided just to take some time to ourselves and having a baby was never, ever far from my mind, but we were fortunate enough to be able to go on, you know, a holiday of a lifetime. For me, that was New York and we were able to go for just for some city breaks and just do some things for us. And I feel that that for me was when, everything changed and yeah I just think I'm not saying like oh go on holiday and then you're full pregnant I just think it's really important when you do get to that point where it's all consuming just to press pause for a little bit and just do some things for yourself and regroup and then come back to it with a different headspace and a different perspective and I think my advice would always be you know fertility is a money maker it is like it's such a big business babies, unfortunately. Um, and I just think to really shop around as often as that might, might sound, compare clinics, make sure that when you are going to clinics, it's a really good fit for you. Because like I said, up and, you know, we were four years in there nearly, you know, just being given the same advice of you're fine. You're both fit and healthy. It's just unexplained. And it just took seeing one doctor, at a different clinic that completely changed our path and I'll like forever be grateful to her so I just think you know do your research and just make sure that every box had been tick has been ticked and that's why it's great to connect with people that are going through the same thing because they'll you know give you advice and oh have you had this done and did they check this and you know maybe you might be like us and find something you know, find something that, that wasn't there all along, if that makes sense. I think that would just be, be my advice, you know, to be, yeah, to be, and also to be like a hopeful realist, like to keep hope and be really positive, but equally, yeah, just be aware of the statistics as doom and gloom as they might be, but just to be real about it as well, you know? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I guess if anyone did have any more questions and they would like to get in contact with you personally, where can they find you? Yeah, no, I am. I'm always there to have those kind of conversations. Um, I guess the best place is probably uh, would be Instagram. And my handle is at married and 29 ish. I'm definitely not 29 anymore, but um, that's, that's my handle. And, you know, I'm always open to people you know, DMing me and having that conversation because I know how useful it was to me when I was going through that. So yeah, I'm always more than happy to have those conversations with anybody that feels that they need it.